This is video number seven in our series from Digital Dash University concerning various topics in quantum mechanics. In the previous video, we were dealing with Hermitian operators, and what we had shown is that for Hermitian operators, when you have an, I'm going to, for right now, interchange the terms eigenvector and eigenfunction. When you have a eigenfunction for it, the eigenvalue is real, and if you have two different eigenfunctions that have two different eigenvalues, then these eigenfunctions are orthogonal to each other. That we demonstrated in the previous video. And then we also said that they could be made orthonormal to each other. It's sort of in a process that's analogous to vectors, where you have a vector and you divide it by its magnitude and you get a unit vector. And how do you do that with a function? Or if you're dealing with functions, for that matter, what exactly is an inner product? So let's just try and clear some of these up by using some examples. First of all, when we're dealing with vectors and we have the inner product, say, of d and e, let's say then that for the two vectors, that d has components alpha 1, alpha 2, say three components, and E, vector E, also has three components, say beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, then to take their inner product, when we're taking the bra of vector D, that means then it's written as a row vector and we're taking the complex conjugate of these. That, of course, is what the um, Dirac Braquette notation is all about. So here, this is written as a row vector with components alpha 1, complex conjugated, alpha 2, and alpha 3. And again, even though we're working with finite uh, vectors at this stage, uh, here they just have three components. We assume that all of these components are complex, because when we're dealing with, um, with quantum mechanics, we're almost always dealing with complex functions. Okay, so this is written as a row vector with, its com with the coefficients as complex conjugates. Then to take the inner product, this just stays as the column vector. like this, then to take the inner product is just simply this alpha 1 complex conjugate times beta 1 plus alpha 2 times complex conjugate times beta 2 plus alpha 3 complex conjugate times beta 3. And that's the inner product. Exactly analogous to when we're taking the uh, dot product of two vectors in calculus. But now, if we have functions, how do we take their inner product? And the definition for that is, in fact, we don't need this either anymore. OK, how do we take the inner product of two functions? That is defined differently. That is the integral of, let's say we have two functions psi n, or theta n, and psi n and psi m. We take the complex conjugate of one of them, say psi m, multiply it by psi n, and let's say we're integrating with respect to x, just to make it simple. And we have some kind of limits on here. But that integral of these two functions multiplied together, evaluated at certain limits, is the inner product of those two functions. So let's take an example, a specific example of this. Let's say that psi n equals e to the i n x. 
So psi m, that would be equal e to the i m x. So let's say n can be any integer, and m can be any integer. So if we're going to take their inner product, he would have the integral, let's say from minus pi to plus pi, that'll be our limits, and then we have to have, we can take the complex conjugate of either one, but let's say we have psi m complex conjugate times psi n. Well, the complex conjugate of this is just e to the minus mx. So that is this. And we multiply these two together then, what we're going to have is e to the i, and we'll have n minus m. x dx. So that's how we would take the inner product of those. Now we're assuming here that everybody is aware that e to the i theta is equal to the cosine of theta plus i times the sine of theta. And when you integrate e, say, to the a times x dx, that's just equal to e to the ax divided by 1 over a. Standard way, of course, for integrating the exponential function. So we can integrate this pretty easily. Let's first do it assuming now that n and m are not equal. So this integral right here would be equal to 1 over this n minus m times i and then times e to the i n minus m x. Where x goes from minus pi to plus pi. So this integral is equal to this expression right here. Now for the moment, let's just ignore this part and concentrate on this. That will equal this part here times the cosine of n minus mx plus i times the sine of n minus mx where x now goes from minus pi to plus pi. So if we go ahead now, and this is just this, we're ignoring this for the moment. Now if we go ahead and plug pi into here and minus pi, what we end up with then, ignoring this for the moment, we get this expression. We have the cosine of m minus n pi minus the cosine of m minus n minus pi. And then we're going to have plus, we write it over here, plus i times the sine of m minus n pi minus the 
the sine of m minus n minus pi. And remember, all of this is multiplied by this. We'll deal with that in a second. Now, the sine of any, the sine of minus theta is minus the sine of theta. So the sine of minus pi could be plus the sine of plus pi. Okay, so let's look at this now. Here we have cosine of m minus n pi minus the cosine of m minus n minus pi. Well, the cosine is an even function. The cosine of theta equals the cosine of minus theta. So these here just cancel each other out. The sine of any number times pi is 0, so that's 0, and likewise, that's 0. So regardless of this, when we integrate and m is not equal to n, we get 0. So let's get rid of this stuff now. So this equals 0 when m does not equal n. Now what happens when m equals n, when they're the same? Then this would be e to the 0, which is 1. So now all we have is the integral from minus pi to pi of dx, and that equals x, going from minus pi to pi, and that equals pi minus negative pi, or that equals 2 times pi. So for these functions, the inner product is either 0 or 2 pi. So what we can say then is and let's get rid of this, go back to our original functions. We can say we know that psi n and psi m are orthogonal because if m does not equal n, their inner product comes out equal to 0. When m equals n, it equals 2 pi. Well, if we can make this be equal to 1, then it will be an orthonormal set of functions. And we can do that, we just simply divide each function by the square root of 2 pi. There, now we have two orthonormal functions. Because now we multiply them together, we have 1 over 2 pi that's out here. So when we integrate, we're going to have 2 pi divided by 2 pi, which is 1. So their inner product is either 0, when m does not equal n, or it equals 1, when m equals n. So here we have two orthonormal functions. And what we were saying now with regard to the Hermitian matrix is that This is operating on some cat where it just equals a constant times that cat. So this is some eigenfunction of this Hermitian matrix. And here we had a different one, a different function, but it also turns out to be another eigenfunction of this. Then the, when lambda a and lambda b, these are distinct, they're real numbers, they're, and they're not equal, then what we showed in the previous video is that these are orthogonal to one another. And we can make them orthonormal to one another if we want to by looking at the specific function, going through the definition, and dividing by whatever we have to divide by, so that when we take the integral, it comes out equal to 1. So that's how we can get an orthonormal function, just as we did right here. 
Okay, that's all we wanted to say in this video. We just wanted to sort of clarify some of the comments that we made in the previous video. And then what we're going to do um, in the next video, we're going to look at another type of operator that plays an important role in quantum mechanics, the unitary operator. So come back, join us for that video, and we can continue our discussion.